Hey there, it's Dr. Justin, and today's talk is going to be on lab testing for inflammation. So we know inflammation is behind any chronic disease. So essentially, inflammation is part of the healing process, but when it's excessive, when it's out of control, that's where there's a problem. And I'm going to talk about lab tests that we can do to assess inflammation. So if you have brain fog, more than likely you have inflammation. If you're chronically sore and pain, more than likely you have inflammation. If you're having a hard time sleeping, having a hard time producing energy, or chronically having a weight gain or have a, a belly size greater than 40 inches for a male or 35 for a female, you betcha you got inflammation. So let's talk about ways to look at this and assess it. So inflammation is good to a certain degree, right? If you get done your CrossFit workout, you want that muscle to be somewhat inflamed because part of the healing response will be hypertrophy, meaning the muscle gets a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger, which is, which is important, especially if um, aesthetics and physique and um, performance is part of your health goal. So when we look at lab tests, there's a couple different labs that we can do. So we can look at blood, and the blood can give us some really interesting things. One of these markers is C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is a really good marker for inflammation. Now, anytime I see someone with CRP, that's the abbreviation, if I see that above, again, greater than 1.0, that's a really good sign that we are starting to have extra inflammation. Really good marker. Next, I want to look at is sed rate, sedimentary rate. If we see that elevated at all in the lab work, we know that is starting to be a sign of inflammation. So any bit of elevation on the lab, inflammation. Again, what we're looking at here is C-reactive protein. We have inflammatory cytokines, right? Different cytokines here. And what's happening is they're actually going down to the liver. Let me break that down. So we have cytokines. I'll put a big C next to it. And then I'm gonna draw the liver. Okay, and these cytokines make their way right down to the liver, just like this. And what the liver does, it actually pumps out as an effect of all these cytokines, it pumps out CRP, C-reactive protein. And so that's where inflammation goes up because we have all these cytokines, which are part of the inflammatory reaction, go into the liver, and the liver then spits out CRP. And the sedimentary rate is another one. When we see the sed rate higher, it's a sign of inflammation. And when we get inflamed, our cells get really sticky in our blood vessels. So that increases the risk for strokes and heart attacks. Down the list we go here, fibrinogen is another one of these markers. Fibrinogen and sed rate is another one that kind of goes hand in hand. And fibrinogen, it's part of the clotting factor, right? We take fibrin or fibrinogen and we convert it to fibrin. That's what forms our clot. So when we start having going above, 250 on a fibrinogen test, this is a sign that we could be excessively clotting, right? Decrease blood flow, decrease blood flow, typically we'll start to see higher blood pressure, and inflammation is usually right behind. So another bad marker there for inflammation. All right, so we have CRP, we have SED, we have fibrinogen. These can all be ordered on your conventional um, blood test. Again, your conventional medical doctor may not order it, but if you see a functional medicine practitioner or a doctor like myself, they should be able to accommodate you. Next, this is a really good marker. Typically when we're eating excessive sugar and excessive carbohydrate, we're gonna be driving inflammation. One of my favorite markers here for inflammation is gonna be the triglyceride, trig for short, to HDL ratio. Triglyceride to HDL ratio. When that ratio is greater than two, right? So if we have triglycerides at 100 and we have HDL at 50, that's a two ratio. So let's say the trigs are now 101, now we're greater than 2.0. That would be a marker of inflammation. Big sign, anytime I see that on a lab work, I automatically know excessive carbohydrate, excessive inflammation, we're driving those inflammatory pathways. I like to see this ratio closer to one to one. So ideally, if we're at HCL of 60, we're gonna have a trig of 60 as well. Another excellent marker. Now, this isn't a sign of inflammation directly, but I like seeing good levels of vitamin D. 
right? Because vitamin D helps balance your immune system. A healthy immune system typically is going to give you a better chance for healthy, healthy levels of inflammation. I didn't say no levels, I said healthy. So having a 25 hydroxy vitamin D, 25 OH vitamin D, ideally 50 to 70 if you don't have an autoimmune condition. 50 to 70 on your blood test. I think that's NG per DL. I could be wrong. That's the conventional one though used in the US. 50 to 70 is a very, very good marker. So a couple of different things here off the bat. Carbohydrates are gonna take this out of whack and if we're just not getting enough sunlight or we're not supplementing vitamin D or we're in the winter months, we may see that low as well. Now again, I've seen lots of patients though that still don't have a lot of inflammation on their blood work, but they have signs and symptoms of inflammation. So other ways in which inflammation can come about that may not be assessed, it could be food allergens. So if we're eating common food allergens like gluten or maybe legumes or maybe nightshades for certain people or even FODMAPs, that could be driving inflammation, right? IBS, people that have IBS, for instance, respond really well to cutting out grains, going on an autoimmune diet, but also cutting out FODMAPs. So certain food allergens may be very hard to test this. The best way is an elimination provocation diet. So I'm gonna write there elimination, elimination diet. may be the best way to assess if you have food allergens. There are some tests out there that you can do. Not a huge fan of food allergen testing. It tend to be a lot of money where you could already find it out with a basic elimination diet. And next thing I see frequently is you got patients walking around with lots of different infections they don't need to be um, possessing. Right? Everyone has the right to be infection free in my book. So if you still have health challenges or health concerns, you want to look a little bit deeper. You want to look at a really good stool or gut test, stool or gut test for chronic infections. I'm going to put my three favorite here, uh, the BioHealth 401H, GIFX by Genova Metametrics and DRG Laboratories, which is a new genetic test I've been using the last few months and it's starting to come out pretty darn good. So we have a couple of different things right here. Next, running a chronic co-infection panel. So if you still have symptoms and we've ruled all these things out and the inflammation is still, nothing's coming back on the lab work, we may wanna look a little bit deeper at co-infection or Lyme testing. We wanna look for Lyme's Lyme and co-infections. So what does this mean? So we have Lyme's, Lyme disease. This is Borrelia burgdorferi. We may do a Western blot that looks at the various bands ranging from the 20s up to the 90s in the various bands, IgM and IgG. We may also look at um, an ELISA testing, which is an enzyme-linked um, immunosorbent assay. And we may also look at the various co-infections, Babesia, Bartonella, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Right, various co-infections that may reside with a Lyme's patient outside of just Lyme's itself. So we talked about a lot of things here, right? The take home message is I want you to be infection free. If we have an infection, it's always good to address that. Number two, we wanna look at standard blood chemistries that may tell us if we have markers of inflammation. If we have markers of inflammation, the simplest thing we can do is go on an elimination diet, cut out all the sources of inflammation in our diet. Right? Manage our blood sugar, eat every four or five hours can be helpful, especially if our adrenals are fried. Making sure we're getting to bed before 11 o'clock is helpful so we can manage our, our growth hormone, our anabolic hormone, so it'll help kind of quench the fire of inflammation. And also managing stress, meditation, uh, gratitude, appreciation, things like that are very, very powerful. Again, studies have shown good conversation and good communication strategies decrease interleukin-6. So we really want to do our best to uh, have healthy habits in our life that reduce stress and inflammation. And if you're looking for early signs, this video should give you some great strategies. And if you're kind of lingering and not quite sure what direction to go in, feel free and click on the screen or click below to get more access to my free information and how to get a hold of me. Again, this is Dr. Justin here signing off. Have a great night.